let's study 9th standard ICAC chemistry chapter 4 atomic structure and chemical bonding an atom is the smallest particle of an element which can take part in a chemical reaction and it may or may not exist independently there are 118 elements discovered so far at school level let's assume that an atom looks like this this is called the planetary model but this is not the reality concept is a bit more complicated but you'll study that in college right now all we need to know is that an atom contains a nucleus which has protons and neutrons and it has orbits which has electrons protons electrons and neutrons are represented like this the lower number for an element usually is the atomic number and the upper number is the mass number but for the subatomic particles the lower number uh, represents the charge so positive charge here and negative charge neutrons are neutral mass as per standard value, protons have a mass of 1 AMU or 1 atomic mass unit. Electrons have a negligible mass. In fact, around 2000 electrons have a mass equivalent to that of one proton. So you can imagine how minuscule an electron is. A neutron's mass is almost the same as that of a proton. It's taken as 1 AMU or 1 Dalton. Now the atomic number. That is the most important or the fundamental characteristic of an element. First of all, what is an element? The difference between an element and a compound is that elements are made up of only one kind of atom. They cannot be broken down into simpler substances by any physical or chemical means. Whereas a compound is made up of two or more types of atoms and they can be broken down into simpler substances by chemical means. Let's take a few examples. Oxygen is an element, whereas water is a compound and oxygen molecule is made up of two atoms of oxygen. Let's write it as O2. Water, on the other hand, is made up of one atom of oxygen and two atoms of hydrogen. This is called Mickey Mouse. Uh, I mean, a molecule of water. Let's write this as H2O. But it's a false notion that a molecule is made up of two or more atoms. Now, this was a diatomic molecule. This is a triatomic molecule. But we can even have monoatomic molecules. For example, helium. Helium is made up of just one atom. It doesn't combine with any other atom. It's inert. It's stable. It's a noble gas. So this atom of helium itself is also called the molecule. You see, atoms may or may not exist independently. An oxygen atom cannot exist independently because it is unstable. Its outermost shell is incomplete. Its octet is not yet achieved. So it will always combine with some other atom of the same element or a different element to become stable, to complete its electronic configuration. And that's the whole reason why all the chemical reactions take place. Because each atom wants to be stable. But some people are born stable. They don't need anybody to settle down. They are single, not ready to mingle. Like noble gases, even noble metals, for example, gold. It's monoatomic. In fact, all metals are monoatomic molecules. They can exist independently. So here this atom is also called the molecule. For compounds, we cannot have atoms. We cannot have an atom of water. We can only have molecules. So next, um, let's say glucose. So that molecule is C6H12O6. That's the smallest particle of this substance, which exists independently. It has totally 24 atoms. On the other hand, Chlorine is diatomic, so it will be a combination of two chlorine atoms because a single chlorine atom cannot exist independently. Ozone, on the other hand, is triatomic. You'll have three oxygen atoms combined. So now we know the difference between atom and molecule, and sometimes both of them may mean the same thing. And now we also know the difference between elements and compounds. Because here, each element is made up of the same type of atom. But here, the compound is made up of two or more elements which can be broken down only with the help of some chemical process. This can be broken down into carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So this is not an element. Water can also be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen, for example, by electrolysis. So water is not an element. Now what is unique about each element is the atomic number. For oxygen, atomic number is 8. For helium, atomic number is 2. For gold, it's, I believe, 79. For chlorine, it's 17, and so on. Atomic number is simply speaking the number of protons in the nucleus, 
which will obviously be equal to the number of electrons because each atom is electrically neutral and that's possible only if the number of protons and electrons are equal. That is the number of positive charges and negative charges are equal. Let me draw the oxygen atom. First, we draw the nucleus. I said atomic number of oxygen is eight. That means it has eight protons, positive charges. And so it should have eight electrons. Now the first shell can only accommodate two electrons. That's the capacity. So how many electrons are left now? Six. That would be in the second shell. One, two, three, four, five, six. But the second shell can accommodate up to eight electrons. So it needs two more electrons to become stable, to achieve its octet, and to become like the nearest noble gas, which is neon. So oxygen's electronic configuration is 2,6, whereas neon's electronic configuration is 2,8. How can it achieve this stability? Well, it just needs two more electrons. And it can get those two electrons either by gaining it from some other atom or by sharing it with some other atom. That's the reason why oxygen reacts with anything to become stable. But note how, after gaining the two electrons, its atomic number is still 8. Even though the number of electrons will now become 2 plus 8, 10. But we still say atomic number is 8 because atomic number is the number of protons. Since now there is an imbalance between protons and electrons, this would have more negative charge because electrons are negative. So it will be charged, 2 minus, means or 2 negative signs here. And we call this an oxide ion, that is O2 minus if it has gained two electrons. I'm not talking about when it shares two electrons. So the difference between an atom and an ion is that, number one, ion is charged, atom isn't. An ion has its outermost shell complete. An atom, it may or may not have its outermost shell complete. Ions can exist independently only in solution form or in a plasma state, but atoms of elements may or may not exist independently. If it's a noble gas or metal, it may exist independently, otherwise it can't. Then what is atomic mass number? Atomic number is number of protons, but the mass number is the number of protons plus number of neutrons. So here it's 16. Oxygen's mass number is 16. But note that the number of neutrons is never fixed. It's possible that instead of 8, it has 9 neutrons. Then what would be the mass number? It would be 17. That's possible. That is called an isotope of oxygen, although it may not be stable. Isotope means atoms of elements having the same atomic number, but different mass numbers because they have different number of neutrons. Note that number of neutrons don't matter as far as chemical reactions are concerned because in chemical reactions, the only thing that participates in the reaction is the electron, which depends on atomic number, not the mass number. And when we calculate the mass number, we are adding protons and neutrons. Why not the number of electrons? Because as I said, electrons hardly have any mass. So we can ignore that. Now, if I tell you that the mass number of chlorine is, let's say, 35, what does this information tell? Well, there is a lot that I can say by looking at this. Atomic number is 17, means its electronic configuration is 2,8,7. It means it has 17 protons, it means it has 17 electrons, and it has 35 nucleons, that is protons plus neutrons. But out of that, 17 are protons, so how many neutrons are there? 35 minus 17? 18 neutrons are there. So I found the number of neutrons also. I can even draw the diagram of chlorine atom now. Chlorine nucleus will have 17 protons and 18 neutrons. Then the first shell will have two electrons. The second shell will have eight electrons. You should draw all diagrams only with pencil and a compass or a pro circle. Freehand diagrams are not allowed. Eight electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the third shell will have seven electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So its last shell is again incomplete. It needs one more electron to become stable, which it can get by either gaining an electron from some metal or sharing an electron with some non-metal. That is why we say valency of chlorine is 1. In fact, after it gains, it will be charged. It's, its electro valency is minus 1 because it will gain a negative charge. Non-metals always are electronegative. Their valencies, electro valencies are negative. Whereas metals, they are electropositive. They always lose electrons. Non-metals gain electrons. 
metals lose electrons. For example, let's take sodium. Sodium is 2,8,1. So, sodium, 2 electrons, 8 electrons, and finally, 1 electron in the last shell. In order to be stable, it would love to lose that one electron so that it becomes 2,8 only because that one electron is gone. That way, it will become stable like neon. So metals always lose electrons to become positive. So they are called cations after they become positive ions, whereas non-metals become anions, that is negative ions. So why are they losing or gaining electrons to become stable like the nearest noble gas? Now these orbits are also called energy shells because the electrons in each shell has a fixed amount of energy and they are labeled as K starting with K, L, M, N and so on. And the number of electrons each can accommodate is given by the formula 2N squared. So if you ask me how many electrons are possible in the M shell, that is the third shell, let me use the formula and find out. 2N squared is equal to 2 into 3 squared is equal to 2 into 9 is equal to 18 electrons. Maximum 18 electrons are possible in the third shell. But if that's the case, what happens if I draw an atom of calcium? Let's see. Nucleus, just drawing the first shell, second shell, and third shell. Calcium's atomic number is 20. So let me draw 20 electrons. I've got two electrons in the first shell. I've got eight electrons in the second shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So then totally 10 done. How many electrons are left? 10 electrons are left. Well, the third shell can have 18 electrons, right? So I can easily fit 10 electrons in the last shell, correct? No. There is one rule. The rule says that whichever is the outermost orbit of an atom, it cannot have more than 8 electrons. That means here, if I fit it with 10 electrons, it's not allowed. I can only fit 8 electrons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So now how many are left? 2 electrons. So that will go in the final shell, the fourth shell. Now the reason behind this will be explained in college level. You see each shell has sub shells, S, P, D, F, which is not there in school syllabus. So don't worry about it. You just have to know that there are certain rules to follow. And fortunately, we just have to know the electronic configurations of elements 1 to 20. That's all. So beyond calcium, uh, things become a little strange. The transition elements, they don't follow the octet rule strictly. The octet rule simply means that you can become stable if you can have eight electrons in the last shell. The duplet rule is applicable only to uh, smaller atoms like hydrogen or helium, lithium. You see, hydrogen just has one electron in the last shell. So to be stable, it needs one more electron. And then the first shell, which is the last shell in this case, is complete. Here, the third shell has capacity for 18 electrons. But it can use this capacity only if it were the second last or the third last shell. If it is the last shell, it cannot have 18 electrons. So you see that if we know the atomic number, we know so many things. We can know the valency, chlorine is minus 1, oxygen is 2, sodium is 1. So we should know the valencies of the first 20 elements. We should learn the entire table, electronic configuration, the valency. Mass number need not be learned. And we should even know if it's a metal, non-metal or a gas. You can see that if the uh, valency is 1, 2 or 3, usually it's a metal. And if, if it's 4, 5, 6, the valence shell that is, then it is a non-metal. The valence electrons, when I talk about valence electrons, I mean the number of electrons in the last shell. So if the number of electrons in the last shell are 1, 2, and 3, we call it a metal. But if it is, uh, if it is 4, 5, 6, 7, we call it a non-metal. And of course, if the last shell is complete, we call it noble gas. There are a few exceptions though. For example, boron is a metalloid and so is silicon. So remember these two exceptions because they have properties of both metals and non-metals. It's a transition between metallic and non-metallic properties. So we call it metalloid. Now, about isotopes, as I said, they are atoms of the same element having the same atomic number but different mass numbers because the number of neutrons are different. Now, since they will have the same electronic configuration, 2,6, 2,6, the chemical properties will be same because chemical properties only depend on the electronic configuration, that is the valency. But the physical properties may be different. Since uh, oxygen 18 is a little heavier than oxygen 16, there will be a difference in their boiling point, melting point, a slight difference. But electronic configuration is the same. It's 2,6 here and 2,6 here. Valency is also 2 and valency here also is 2. So the chemical properties are same. 
sometimes atomic mass on average may be a decimal value for example chlorine's mass is taken as 35.5 because we have two isotopes of chlorine available chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 this one has 18 neutrons this one has 20 neutrons but the percentage of chlorine 35 is more in nature so if you take a weighted average then we say that its mass number is 35.5 how that average is calculated that is not in syllabus now let's understand how ionic compounds are created now look at sodium and chlorine sodium has one electron extra and chlorine has one deficient electron to become stable sodium will donate one electron you see metals always give electrons and giving of electrons is called oxidation that is losing electrons and gaining electrons is called reduction so sodium forms a cation and chlorine forms a anion make sure you write the brackets also this is called the cross and dot structure where the dots represent electrons so now both of them are stable 2,8 2,8 2,8 they have acquired the electronic configuration of the nearest noble gas However, now they are charged and opposite charges attract each other. So they stick to each other to form NaCl. A molecule of sodium chloride is formed and since there are ions involved, it is called an ionic compound or an electrovalent compound. Similarly, for calcium oxide, calcium loses two electrons, oxygen gains two electrons, calcium becomes a cation, oxide is an anion and they are attracted to form calcium oxide. Remember that ionic compounds are formed between metal and non-metal. But what if there are two non-metals? Non-metals don't donate electrons. Non-metals share electrons. So, here, transfer of electrons is not possible. If you look at nitrogen, nitrogen's electronic configuration is 2,5 and 2,5. Each of them requires three electrons to become stable. But neither is willing to donate their three electrons. So what they will do is, they will share the electrons. Because sharing is formation of covalent compounds and the bond is called covalent bond or molecular bond there are no ions formed here there is no positive or negative charge here since they are sharing three pairs of electrons it's called a triple bond let me show how water molecule is formed so we have this oxygen atom this is the nucleus the first orbit has two electrons yes all orbits have to be shown compulsorily and this one has six electrons one two three four five six it needs two more electrons to be stable and all it has are hydrogen atoms nearby and they are not willing to give electrons they are not so generous as metals they also want one electron to complete their duplet and achieve the electronic configuration of the nearest noble gas for them it is helium and for her it is neon so when they combine let's see what happens this is a nucleus by the way two electrons second orbit second orbit one, two, three, four, five, six. And let me draw a hydrogen atom. You have to draw this with a compass or with pro circle. You cannot draw it freehand. Hydrogen's electron here, hydrogen's electron here. So you can see that now oxygen seems to be having eight electrons in a last shell, so it's stable. Hydrogen seems to be having two electrons in its last shell, so that is also stable. So see, the atoms have become stable by cooperating with each other. And here we say that hydrogen, single bond, oxygen, single bond, hydrogen. So there are two single bonds. One bond simply means a pair of electrons are shared. And covalent bonds are formed only between non-metals. Hi students, this is AJ sir. If you like this video, press the like button. If you would like to enroll for my online test series or online lectures, email me or message me on Instagram. Check the description for more information.